Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. This month's show is about binocular observing equipment and accessories. With me in the studio are several guests, all members of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club. To my right, I have uh, Bob Fitzgerald. Then to my left, Ken Anderson and Steve Witte. Gentlemen, welcome all. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We're going to start out uh, talking to Bob Fitzgerald here to my right with his parallelogram setup. So Bob, what's the advantage of having a setup like this to observe with binoculars? Well, there are several advantages, as you know, because you're very involved in it. When we put on uh, stargazing events, we get people of all different heights. We get dads who want to look up here because that's where their eyes are. And we get the youngsters who are down here and we don't want them climbing on ladders to look at things. That's so right. the advantage of the parallelogram is, and I'll just turn it this way a little bit so you can see it. The binoculars always point, no matter how, how high or how low you move this, the binoculars are always going to point at whatever they're initially set on. It's not like a tripod where you would loosen the tripod, lower the uh, eyepieces, and then you're not sure that the kid is, is looking at, at what, what the father was looking at because you've lowered it this way and he's no longer looking there. These will always point at whatever you initially set them on. So when, when the child pulls it down after the father looks, then they're still going to be pointing on the Andromeda galaxy or whatever the father was looking at. The only adjustment we have to make with the binoculars is for younger people, we have to squeeze the barrels together to... To change the, the distance. The, the interocularity distance, as they call it. Well, this certainly makes for a uh, very uh, user-friendly setup for a star party. As you mentioned, from the very tall to uh, the not-so-tall. Yes. And uh, is this uh, setup easy to move around? Very easy. Uh, it would take two people to lift uh, the legs of the tripod and slide it over, not because it's heavy, only because the, the legs would have a tendency to, to collapse on it. But you really don't have to move it, because if I can just sit down here, when I observe, not at star parties, I'll just sit down in a chair, and I can roll a chair around, and uh, I can be looking at any part of the sky uh, that I want, which is, is, is what I do. And I usually use a, a table with a star chart uh, on it, uh, okay. something like a, a music stand. And I can uh, go from what I know to what I don't know, which is a good way to learn the sky. Sort of star hopping? Star hopping, exactly right. And it's an excellent way to, to learn the sky and to learn where the, what's in the constellations, especially if you're looking for objects which are rather difficult to find, like double stars, uh, clusters, star clusters, and I'm sure your, your audience knows, have heard, has heard about those. That's a, a great idea, using a music stand as a high school musician. I can yes. see holding it up like this rather than down on a table is a great advantage. Yeah, and you don't have, you have your hands free for a cup of hot chocolate or anything you want. Well, that's great. Uh, Bob, that's, this is a great setup. Uh, I'm glad you were able to bring it uh, today. Thank you for inviting me. With our, uh, with our viewers. We're going to talk next to uh, Ken Anderson. And Ken, what have we got here? This looks like double barrel fun. Yes, this is. This is uh, Greg Klinecklian's uh, BT-80s. They're a binocular telescope of 80 millimeter aperture. And the one reason why we're, we're bringing these out uh, for you to see is they are angled at a 45 degree and, and um, some expensive uh, binoculars can be angled at 45 degrees which enable you to look up at the zenith you know without having to, to crank your head and neck way it back. It makes for an easier observing session right. with that angle. And uh, you can also find binoculars that have a 90 degree bend and then you could look straight out and you'd really be looking at the zenith. So these, these have an advantage of um, having the, the 45 degree bend and then also they have two separate eyepieces so you can actually interchange These are regular powers. telescope eyepieces? Regular, regular eyepieces, yes, so they are. And can you change the interocular distance on this as well? As Bob yes, you can. So 
if, if you have like a little kid that has close eyes, you can bring them in close. I'll just point it out here so you can see it. So they're close, and then if you're further away, like a big adult, uh, you can spread them apart. And Interesting. You can focus each eye individually um, as required. And then with, a, with any type of heavy uh, binoculars, you need to have a really good tripod. And uh, Greg has that down here where you can see how, how it's braced at the bottom. And it, it's not just three legs, they're double supported legs. Well, I see we have this stand with three legs, and now I notice that you've got binoculars with one leg. Right. So this is, a, this is called a monopod, and this is a Garrett monopod. It only costs about $100, but what's nice about this is, you know, you, you can point it up at the zenith, and you can just adjust the height really easily, you know, so you'd be able to look right up at the zenith, which is normally hard to do. Well, think, so yeah, the back it, of your neck would get awful sore. It's easy, it's easy to look at anything, so you would just, like if I'm looking at an object, I'd just look over there and then bring the binos right up. And, you know, if you have a different person, just like Bob said, you can just crank it down. And, and these will stay aimed at the same object even though you're increasing it, or decreasing it, the height? It, it's not as steady as Bob's is because, you know, you can tilt it. Mm. But it, it's relatively close, and, and if they're not too high-powered, the object would stay in the field of view. Now another thing that's nice about the, the Garrett monopod is everything's twist grip, uh, the pistol grip. Um, you know, you can it, it locks in place, which is really nice. Another thing that's nice is if you get uh, different bases, they, they're very easy to interchange different binos. You know, so I have like three different binos, and you know I'd be able to keep it at the same angle, and I can interchange the binoculars really easy. And the one advantage of a monopod is it's very easy to look at many different objects in the sky. Uh, you can do it very quickly, and it gives you a nice steady position because it, it doesn't rock as much as when you're hand holding it. Much more steady because your arms are obviously going to start right. to get tired if you're trying to hold up a larger so, so, binocular. So the two binos that I have, I have 9 by 63 and 15 by 63. I do have different... Uh, uh, mounts on the top. The brackets are different, so even though the binos look alike, um, I can tell by the bracket which power they are. Without... Very interesting, Ken. I want to uh, get to the last item that we have over here with uh, Stephen. This looks like uh, quite uh, an engineering gizmo here. Yeah, so I saw the plans for this on the Sky and Telescope website. And so the binoculars mount up here. Uh, and this uh, uh, tilts, I'll get to that in a minute, but it's basically a piece, of, uh, it's, a, it's made of wood, and uh, the idea is to stabilize your, uh, your experience, mm -hmm. so I'm going to put them on, and so there's a, a weight in the back, which is just a piece of wood, and it, and it keeps the, the binoculars from moving left and right uh, primarily. You've got um, a counterbalance there. So it's a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you put your, your eyes uh, up to the eyepieces. And um, it's funny, but on the Sky and Telescope website, there's a, a do-it-yourself page, and there are mm -hmm. a bunch of things among this. But if you follow the links on this project, which is Image Stabilize Your Binoculars, um, uh, you'll find that there are dozens of people who have built these and every single one of them has changed the design just a little bit. So in that, in that sense, uh, we have added a uh, red dot finder, which is not in the regular design, in the normal design. And we just have it uh, uh, sort of bolted on the end here. And what this gives you that uh, you wouldn't have normally, at least uh, as an experienced binocular user, I don't need a finder to find things. I use the binoculars for that. These are 10 by 50 binoculars. They have a wide field of view. It's not that difficult to find things. But what the finder, what the red dot finder does, is it allows someone else to find something for you, for, for a, a, a beginner. So the beginner would be looking through the binoculars, and then the expert would find something, and Ken will help me out here. So. So basically, we're going to go aim at a drometer. So I would aim it like that. And I say, you should be able to see it now, because I see the red dot right where it's supposed to be. And do you see it? And I should be able to see it. And there it is, right in the ceiling. 
<laughs> this is this is fascinating. I, I love the simplicity, simplicity, and the innovative design. Uh, so uh, a couple things. It it was only a couple of hours for me to build this, and the tools, the woodworking tools that I have, are really rudimentary. Um, I have a skill saw. I have a screwdriver. Uh, I have sandpaper. And that was pretty much it, right? So you don't need a workshop full of equipment to be able to make this. Uh, well, I certainly did without it. <laughs> and I mostly used scrap wood around the house. So uh, only these two uh, longer um, uh, pieces of wood, and they're like uh, two by, they're one by twos, and they're uh, uh, six feet long. Okay. And uh, only those weren't in my house, and so I had to spend, I don't know, five or six bucks to... Uh, to, to buy a little bit of wood, but I had everything else. Um, the other experiment that I did was I wanted to see how high in the sky I could look. And if you, if you go really high and you aim it up, um, you should be able to get to the zenith, but I found what it was comfortable was 70 degrees up. And I've figured that out by actually looking at a star and then looking at a planetarium program to find out where that star was at that moment. So you can use this anywhere at any time, very inexpensive to make, and really expands the possibilities for binocular Absolutely. Surgery. So it's very cheap, and uh, it's quite portable. Uh, it's, um, it's certainly a step up from hand-holding binoculars. I want to thank all of uh, my guests here for uh, sharing their insights and innovation on uh, binocular observing equipment and accessories. We're going to take a short break. Have you... Uh, see term of the month and after that we'll be back with more binocular observing accessories. The term of the month for August 2013 is large binoculars but before I get to large binoculars I want to start with very small binoculars. I have with me right now one by 6.5 binoculars that's these my eyes dilate out to 6.5 millimeters. Now if you combine the light from both oculars, in this case my eyes, uh, what you do is you multiply by the square root of two the, the diameter. So in this case, uh, that gets me to about nine millimeters of equivalent single. Next up are 25 by 150 Fujinon binoculars. So 25 power, 150 millimeters in diameter is six inches. This is essentially two refracting telescopes. Several comets have been discovered with these binoculars, this brand, this model, including the uh, great comet of 1996, Hayakitaki. So these six-inch oculars are equivalent to an eight-inch telescope. Um, next up, we have 60 by 406. This is essentially two Dobsonian telescopes, Newtonian uh, telescopes, in this case, 16-inch telescopes. And 60x, 400 millimeter diameter, equivalent to a 22 inch telescope. And then finally, we have the granddaddy, the 2000 by 8400 large binocular telescope. This is 28 foot telescopes side by side as a single instrument, equivalent to a 39 foot telescope. Not portable, took eight years to build, but it's an awesome machine. And that's uh, term of the month for August 2013, large binoculars. Welcome back to our program. Our show this month is about binocular observing equipment and accessories. With me in the studio now are two of my guests from before, Stephen Witte and Ken Anderson. We're going to start out with Stephen to my right. and. Uh, Stephen, can you fill our viewers in on this wonderful looking contraption? Okay, so uh, Ford member and uh, current uh, uh, Warren Club uh, president, um, John Blum, uh, put together this, uh, it's, a, it's, it's kind of an interesting contraption. So it's a chair mounted on a swivel mount, so you can look anywhere in the sky, you can go all the way around. and. Uh, the chair uh, also has uh, a stable platform for binoculars. So the platform can move up and down. So you can move up 
and, and look at very high in the sky or closer to the horizon. So the, uh, and this, so this provides a stable platform for the binoculars. And then you use your binoculars as, as usual. But also, if that's not enough, you can, you can tilt the chair back, and then you can move the binocular platform so that you can get very high and comfortably see straight up, maybe even farther. It's uh, really quite the, wi quite the widget. So you can get it in kit form, and you can also get the chair uh, as uh, a pre-assembled uh, just use it chair. And it this, this really resembles a typical beach reclining chair. It is a beach reclining chair. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and I noticed the, the label on the arm here says the couch potato telescope. <laughs> um, that just about sums it up. Yeah, pretty and, much sums it up. <laughs> and as, Astro Gizmos also has a very similar type uh, chair. Oh, okay. Absolutely. And Any other special? Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. Show me you can pivot too. So yeah, yeah, you can pivot, you can, you can go up and down, and uh, yeah, pretty much do whatever you want. You can just go wild with it. It almost looks like a flight simulator chair, actually. <laughs> you just need a, the function. You just need a joystick. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put just about any size binocular on. Uh... Yeah, so these are relatively uh, uh, modest 10 by, uh, uh, 10 by 50s. Uh, John Blum often uses a 15 by 50, so a little bit higher power. Uh, 70s. And uh, right, you can certainly use uh, larger apertures as well. It can withstand quite a bit of weight. Is and there a way to counterbalance with these different size? Uh... Well, the, um, the various joints here can be uh, adjusted for how tight they are. And uh, so for heavier, heavier binoculars, you tighten these things up more and up here too. And if for lighter binoculars, you can loosen them up and move a little quicker. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, we're going to uh, move next to uh, Ken Anderson. And uh, Ken, are you sure you're not in a sci-fi movie somewhere? Yep. Uh, it looks like I'm uh, doing a virtual reality set here. Exactly. But, uh, but these are, uh, what I have is uh, 2.3 by 40 uh, Blue Planet uh, opera glasses. Uh, and I have them with a hands-free uh, headset, so it enables me to not have to hold them up. Uh, so I have used them uh, looking at meteor showers and fireworks, and you know, so I'm able to tilt my uh, zero gravity chair back, and I can look up at the zenith, and uh, they they work pretty good. Uh, you know, if if you do walk, you you can look through the cracks, but uh, you got very bad tunnel vision, uh, so you, sometimes you need to have a person assisting you when you're walking, so you're not don't step in any potholes. Uh, are these a fairly step. wide field of view? Um, yes, these are a 28 degree field of view, so they are very wide. I'm just going to take it off so you can see it's not very hard to get off, and, and this is what it looks like on the back side. Um, so I'll let you hold on to these. And the next thing that I have is uh, this is a Manfrotto uh, light arm, and uh, so you can. Set this up to your eyes uh, where you're looking. So, like, let's say I'm looking over at the clock over there, at the objects. So I would set it over here, reach for this arm, and yeah, but this is the hard part. Getting that to crank around. Getting, oh, okay. it, getting that to crank down. Okay. And uh, and then uh, you know, so you you can uh, you can look at at an object steady, and uh, it didn't hold in place. I guess I don't have enough friction, but. Uh, uh, you know, you'd be able to, to look at an object uh, hands-free this way. A problem with binoculars, if you're holding them by hand, after a while they get heavy, uh, mm -hmm. you have a hard time keeping the object in the field of view. And so, so I can see where both of these types of objects, uh, both the mounted here to the chair and the hands-free, would be very uh, advantageous. Yeah. So, uh, so this type of chair is good even with any handheld binos. They don't have to be with a headset. Uh, because you can look at the zenith, and uh, you can take it to your sporting events. And the wide-angle binos are looking great for looking at any, uh, you know, kid events, sport events, shows, uh, and general Milky Way. Now, but, uh, if you didn't have this set up on here, uh, is this chair designed then? You could put your elbows on these arms to help you support a, a pair of binoculars. Well, normally, what I do when I when I'm observing with binos, I, I always tuck my 
elbows in. That that steadies me up. I, I don't really use the armrest, but you know you can you can lie back and you know still hold the stuff held in. And then still have a fairly steady uh, view of what you're looking right. at. But obviously, this or this would offer you even more steadiness to look for a longer period. Right. And uh, and I I had thought about putting a lazy Susan underneath the chair so I can pivot like Steve did with his. Would you motorize it so you could just kind of turn? No, but some people on cloudy nights have done that and they have a power, they, they take a power drill and they just put it down and they, they have the power drill crank them around, <laughs> you know. I so. love uh, American ingenuity and uh, innovation. In the last couple of minutes uh, that we have, Ken, is there anything else that uh, we don't have here in the studio, but would be a great accessory for binocular viewing? Uh, we've seen uh, the walking stick. We've seen the chairs. Uh. Yeah, mon monopods are really good. We we showed saw that, and in, in, in the past we have uh, talked about solar filters as an addition, so you can look at the sun in addition to the night sky. Anything for beginners in particular that? Uh... Um, I would say for beginners, uh, you'd probably want to start with uh, lower power, like seven by fifties or lower power. Uh, because they're lighter weight, uh, you have a larger field of view. Um, people tend to have a, a problem with uh, higher power binos, you know, because they you, they don't hold them still enough. Okay, so that that shaking that yes. really degrades their view. Uh, we do want to tell uh, our audience if you have any uh, questions, uh, you could please send us an email. You can see the email uh, address down there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, don't forget our website. Uh, we've got that as well. Uh, you can uh, get additional information there, too. Uh, you can do great astronomy with a simple pair of binoculars. Uh, most folks uh, seem to have an old pair of 7 by 45s uh, in the back of the closet, you know, collecting dust. Uh, dig those out. Take them outside. Uh, take a look what the night sky has to offer. It is the best free show in the universe. I want to thank my guests for being here. We hope you've enjoyed the show and please stay tuned for Steve Witte who will bring you What's Up in the Night Sky. What's up in the night sky for August 2013? Well, first, as usual, we have the moons. The uh, 6th of August has us with a new moon, so you won't see the moon uh, pretty much on the 6th. On the 14th, we have the first quarter moon. So the first quarter moon is visible in the evening and, uh, and to about midnight. And then on the 20th, we have a full moon so this is up all night from sunrise to from sunset to sunrise and then on the 28th we have the third quarter moon which is really a morning object uh, after midnight until uh, about noon and uh, so uh, mornings are a great time during the day to see a uh, third quarter moon in august we have probably the most watched uh, meteor shower uh, certainly the most popular. In the summer, it's nice and warm, and, um, and the meteor shower is, is quite good. You can see meteors almost any night, but on the Sunday the 12th, we have the peak of the Perseid meteor shower. Now, if staying up late on a Sunday is bad for your Monday morning commute, then try it on Saturday, because Saturday, it will still be quite good, uh, it just peaks probably on Sunday night. So, this is a good year for the Perseid meteor shower. The first quarter moon sets, and you know if you're watching for meteors after midnight, then the first quarter moon will be will have set, and the sky will be that much darker. You should be looking for a dark sky site to watch for meteors. 
The Perseid meteor stream comes from the comet Swift-Tuttle. So it's debris from this comet that is, has spread out into the whole orbit of, uh, of the comet. And it intersects, the, the orbit intersects with the Earth's orbit, and that orbit always intersects. So we get uh, a reliable uh, meteor, meteor shower every year. So in addition to looking for a dark sky site, you should bundle up because even though it may be hot in August, it may be cold at night. And meteor watching is something that you do uh, where you're not really that active. You're just sort of sitting there. This chair that I'm sitting in is an ideal meteor watching chair because what you want to do is you want to use just your eyes so that you can see as much sky as you can and you want to see as much sky as you can by leaning back. And this chair lets you lean back and enjoy the entire heavens. So in the evenings, we have Venus and Saturn uh, just, uh, just after sunset. So Venus is there on the right. Uh, and uh, Saturn is up uh, in Virgo, up to the left. You probably won't be able to see uh, the stars of the constellation Virgo, but you'll be able to see Venus certainly, and Saturn up to its right, uh, up to its left. You should be able to see uh, relatively easily. So this shot is from 9:10 p.m. on the 15th of August, but you know it'll be a little different during the month. But this is sort of the idea. Neptune and Uranus are uh, visible here shown at 11 p.m. on the 15th. And so we still have Neptune in Aquarius. We have uh, Uranus in uh, Pisces. And the great square of Pegasus is still uh, over Uranus. You'll need a really good sky chart for both of these uh, planets. And you should um, uh, uh, you should really have a sky chart prepared because even though Uranus is borderline naked eye visible, uh, it is hard to find even with binoculars or a telescope uh, and impossible without uh, a sky chart. Finally, in the morning, at 4.30 in the morning, we have Jupiter and Mars. So uh, you can kind of see to the right there you can see Betelgeuse. Now, this is the armpit of Orion. So if you go up early enough, then you can spot um, Orion early in the season. Uh, Jupiter and Mars are great, in a are great in a telescope. And that's what's up for August 2013. Now, as Phil Harrington said, two eyes are better than one. <laughs>